everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Harry DeWolf. Hi Harry. Hello. <laughs> Just a little introduction. Harry is an editor and author of Edit Ready or How to Make Your Book As Good As You Can Make It Before You Send It To An Editor, which is something that all authors need. So before we get into editing, Harry, tell us a bit more about you and your journey into writing and editing and also where you are in the world, because I know people will be interested. Well, yeah, because, because uh, I think writers have... A lot of people who want to become writers, in fact, a lot of people who are writers, to be fair, have this romantic notion that they will eventually be able to sell up and move to France and write full time. And the thing is, I think they get it the wrong way around. <laughs> I live in rural France. In rural France, uh, the cost of living is really low. The cost of housing is really low. If you want to become a full time writer and you already speak a bit of French, I think the best way is probably to move to France first and then then become a writer because becoming a writer uh, takes up a lot of your time uh, and actually if you can afford to live on a part-time job, which you can living where I live, then why not? So yeah, it's kind of the romantic dream and I do live in the middle of nowhere, I'm a long way from anywhere as well. Um, but. Um, and it doesn't really have anything whatsoever to do with the work that I do. It's kind of a historical accident why I'm here, but it's nice. I can. I feel like I, I could make up a different story every time someone asks me the question. But... <laughs> well, tell us, tell us the current story. How did you end up where you are and your writing and editing journey? Well, my editing journey is... Um, uh... So this, it already start, it's already starting to sound like a, a story plot. But when I was at university, um, I met a guy who was... Um, I met and became very good friends with him, uh, who kind of uh, sorted me out, got me back on track uh, after I'd been through some difficult times. And, um, and he's a very good writer um, and has been a good friend for many, many years. Uh, he now lives uh, in Florida, of all places. Um, but a few years ago, it's quite a few years ago now, I think it was 2007-ish, uh, he was about to put a book out and he asked me if I would read it for him and he said that he would pay me some uh, trivial sum to read it for him. And, uh, and at that moment, I, I kind of realised that this was something I could do. Uh, and... I'd, I'd already done a lot of writing myself, but nothing that I was satisfied with. And when he said to me, about a year after that, he said to me, look, uh, there's this whole self-publishing thing going on now that you probably haven't noticed, because I hadn't noticed it, uh, and that there is a big demand for people who have the kind of skills and knowledge that you've got and so on. Uh, and so why don't you get started doing it? Um, and so I did. And I found a few, um, first few clients straight, straight away. And I said, what I keep coming back to, what most people, in fact, the question most people ask is, why uh, am I editing rather than writing? Because when I edit, my editing, is, my expertise is in telling stories. That's what I specialize in. So why edit rather than write and sell my own books? And. It's not an easy question to answer until you realise that um, it's, it's, it's a different skill set. Uh, it is about understanding how stories work and it is about knowing all of the things that authors know. But I think what it's also about is it's knowing all of the things that readers know as well. I never tire of saying that readers are much better at being readers than authors are at being authors. Uh, the people who are the most skilled in the in the whole conversation of the readers, uh, what I have is a capacity to communicate it. Because there are plenty of readers who can tell you whether they liked a book or not, and even tell you why. But can they relate that back to a creative process? And that's what I've been doing. And it's what I've been learning how to do. Because I guess that's the other side of it. Writing looks like quite a solitary occupation it looks like it from the outside i mean you know i know actually 
writers spend most of their time chatting to each other on forums uh, rather <laughs> rather than actually writing uh, or listening to podcasts or finding any excuse they can not to do any writing and get a bit of human contact. But writing looks like quite a solitary opera, um, uh, occupation. Editing is a shared creative experience. And I get a massive kick out of that. Hmm. No, that's fantastic. And I mean, I think one of the the main issues as well is, and I was talking to someone the other day, and um, you know, she said I used to think an editor was just about fixing typos. So, can you explain the difference between like what an editor does at the level of story and uh, fixing typos in grammar, which can often be left to a, a proofreader? Again, it's a separate skill set, and what's done by a low level editor. So what's done by someone who edits copy, uh, someone who edits proofs, is part of the publication process. So it's ensuring that your book is actually ready to put out there. Uh, it's, it's one of those, as I never tire of saying, necessary steps. What I do often isn't a necessary step. There are plenty of authors who can manage without it. But that last stage of proofing, that is a necessary step. But it's something that you do to ensure that all of those little detail things, uh, the nuts and bolts of it, that they're all correct. And so the scope of that is limited to one book. What I do has a much, much broader scope. Because although, yes, I will pick up details of spelling, of grammar, of punctuation, if I see a pattern in the errors... I'm also looking at style, I'm looking at voice expression, uh, I'm looking at narrative technique, um, and more broadly speaking, I'm looking at uh, storytelling technique and I'm looking at the creative process because the scope of my intervention goes beyond just one manuscript. The scope of it is actually identifying where are the weaknesses in an author's technique so that I can teach them how to put it right. Or, I mean, it's complicated because it, it's creative. Sometimes you can't just say, look, you're making this particular kind of narrative structure error, stop doing it. <laughs> Sometimes what, what you have to do, because uh, a copy editor can, a copy edi editor can say, you're consistently spelling this word wrong, or you're consistently using the wrong word here. Um, and that's fine, you can put that right. Uh, but if I say, uh, that your um, that the reader is not building a clear picture of what kind of story he's going to read, um, and that needs to come sooner. For many writers, what what they need then is to go away and to spend some time rewriting. Uh, it becomes uh, almost an introspective process where they discover their solution to that problem, and they come back and write it again. Uh, with their solution and it, this has a dual benefit it's that there is no better way of, uh, of fixing that kind of creative problem than by finding your solution to it but also it means that however you put it right is still your creation so I'm not going to come in I'm not going to rewrite what you've written uh, and sometimes I'll say sometimes it's hard even for me to say exactly what's missing so to come back to your question, what's the difference? The difference is I'm looking at how you tell a story, what your story is, how you present it to the reader, how the reader reacts to it. One of my biggest areas of, uh, of discussion with authors is the experience that the reader has reading your book and how you manage and control that experience. And that's where I'm working. And I'm working there because I see uh, the business of being a writer. Uh, I see the success in, being the, uh, the, in the business of being a writer as resting on two pillars. Uh, the first pillar I characterise as no one can buy your book if they don't know it exists. So the first pillar has to be reaching your market. But the second pillar is if your book is no good, no one who's read it will read your next one. Mm. But also, if your book is very good, then 
the first pillar is going to be easier to scale on your next book. It's going to be easier to get it out there. So I'm concentrating on that quality side, mm. uh, Which... on making sure it's a good read. Which is interesting. And I wanted to pick up on that. And we're going to come to, obviously, we're going to talk about self-editing before it gets to an editor. But I want to pick up on on the use of your word um, good or no good, um, because I was interested that you describe yourself as a literary editor. And there's always this discussion on the word literary, and especially around good and no good and what is a quality read, um, when Fifty Shades of Grey has sold 100 million copies and many people would like that kind of success. And if you're, again, mentioning the author business and success as an author business, then we're, we are wanting to write books that have commercial, uh, commercial hit as such, as well as um, being a good read. So I'm really interested in your thoughts of this and why you particularly use the phrase literary editor when um, many genre authors um, might be concerned by that, the use of that word. For a long time, I didn't even realise that, that an issue existed. And the reason is that literary editor just happens to be what historically this role was called. It had nothing to do with something being literary or non-literary. Uh, in, in, if you like, there are two different domains here colliding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, uh, in old-fashioned publishing, so if you go back like 60, 70 years, uh, a literary editor was actually a type of, uh, was a, a type of commissioning or agency editor. Uh, who dealt with fiction uh, and therefore provided actually a lot of help to authors that I provide, but as part of a publishing house. Uh, or the other thing that a literary editor was, was the book editor on a periodical. Um, and it's only uh, once you, you get these domains starting to get mixed up, because now we see genres which were originally something that were decided actually by distrib distributors uh, and to a much, much lesser extent, librarians. Uh, and uh, they, distributors, they suffer when they can't see an, an easy category to place something into. And to be fair, so do readers. Mm, definitely. D distributors categories exist so that readers can do a little bit of pre-sorting so they can find their next book because otherwise they're overwhelmed with choice mm. so it's essential so i didn't actually see this as an issue and then when people started pointing it out to me saying you know do you think there are genre writers who aren't coming to you because you've called yourself a literary editor um and uh it's like what never occurred to me before and and and, for, and then I've, I've been thinking well i'd kind of like to reclaim the term after all what does it mean literary it means of or pertaining to literature. And what's literature? Well, it's written stuff. That's all it is. I, I don't see any difference. I mean, it's very interesting that you said Fifty Shades of Grey, hugely successful, uh, but many people would not consider that good writing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Dan Brown, hugely successful. Many people would not consider that good writing. Good writing is being measured the wrong way. Good writing satisfies a reader. Mm. So a reader who puts the book down and says, that was a really enjoyable experience, that is a reader who is satisfied, and that's what good writing is. Pe different people need different things to be satisfied by the book that they're reading. Uh, but clearly, millions of people have been satisfied by Fifty Shades of Grey one way Over or another. Over 100 million people have been satisfied. <laughs> yes. They've, they've experienced the satisfaction um, of, of reading that particular book. And similarly, uh, Da Vinci Code was clearly enormously satisfying. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I've read a couple of them. And Da Vinci Code, I found um, kind of, I found it frustrating because actually, although it's a very enjoyable read, there's a better book in there. It could have been even better. Oh, yeah. And I do. I think one of the problems with Dan Brown, by the lost symbol, which um, I think is the one coming out oh, soon. Oh, no, that's Inferno is going to come out, isn't it? As a film. Um, it, it really needed an editor. So, you know, I totally get you with that. And I've read all the Dan Brown. I do think Dan Brown had a bit of a hand on the merchandising side because the Vatican banned the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's still one of the best-selling books of all time. So there's definitely something yes. there. And 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 as I say, for me, that's a good book. Mm. 
Uh, I haven't read Fifty Shades, um, and I'm not likely to make time for it soon. But I don't need to. When something has that kind of success and people are actually reading it, mm. that means that that for me that's what a good a good book is a good read. Uh, you don't have to be okay. Let's go to extremes. It doesn't have to be Umberto Eco. Uh, uh, you know, and in fact, Umberto Eco, arguably, how good that is, how good Name of the Rose is, is limited because actually, those readers who can be satisfied by it are yes, hugely satisfied, but there aren't many of them. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because I I write in that genre, and Umberto Eco, The Name of the Rose, and I revisited it recently, and I was like, goodness, this is a really hard read, and in fact, I couldn't even finish other of others of his books, and I think many people just remember the film of The Name of the Rose, um, whereas Dan Brown is much easier to read. So uh, anyway, just on the literary good thing, I, I I love your answer. I think it's brilliant, and I I wish you luck with reclaiming the word literary <laughs> because I think <laughs> I think it's we not might happen. It's not going to happen, no. no. Um, but let's let's talk about um, you know your the, the book your you know how to make the book as good as you can. So one of the issues with um, us writing our first drafts is that sometimes we just can't see the problems. So what and you see a lot of manuscripts. So what are the top three things that you find wrong in most first novels? So really looking at you know first time novelists, what are the things that you go okay this is my, this must be your first novel because. <laughs> okay. So again. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad you warned me about this question in advance. Okay, and I'll tell you why. I I, I did um I did an infographic which was the ten things that come up the most often. Um, and what was really interesting about doing that was that uh, was that in fact those ten things they're not new writer errors. They're writer errors. Mm. And the fact is, a writer who hasn't, who hasn't realised they're making the error yet can actually have quite a lot of success without realising that they are. It's only if you make all of them that it becomes really obvious. So, so I had to think to myself, well, what, what makes a new writer really, really recognisable? And uh, initially I, thought, I said to myself, well, there are only two things, but I then realised that there was a third. And I'm going to give you the third first. The third one is they send me their first draft. Ah, interesting. This is a really important point because writing a story, no, creating a story can't be done first go. Unless you've had lots and lots of practice. Mm. If you've had lots and lots of practice, I have... You have, I bet, you know, uh, I don't know if you do this for fun, I certainly do, but I like to get people to improvise a story. And I find it very, very easy. Uh, and if you, in fact, it's even easier if you just ask the people around you for elements of the story, like in an improv show, you just say, you know, what's the main character and what's their problem and all that kind of thing, you improvise a story. When you've done it enough times, you get an instinct for what a story needs in order to be a story. Mm. And so you can write a first draft that's already definitely a story because you know where it's going to go. Even then, a first draft is still not something to send to an editor mm. because your first draft is always your discovery. Uh, whether, you're, uh, whether it's completely the first time or whether it's your 30th, 40th book, your first draft is still discovering what the story is really going to be, no matter how much of a planner you are, no matter how exhaustive your wall charts are. Uh, um, um, and, <laughs> yes, and, and you know who you are, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> that, that won't be me. But no, that's I agree. Not that's not you, but it is to one person. So that's the first one. Is yeah. The story is, is you have to do a second draft. Because you have to go back to those early parts of your book knowing what's going to happen later on. Mm. Uh, and you can always spot the opportunism. You can always, you can always, always see when the writer has, is three quarters of the way through and they've just had a brilliant idea. You can always see it. And that's the kind of thing that gets eliminated in a second draft. That's the obvious kind of thing, but there are lots of much more subtle things that do. So that's number, that's, that's number three. Uh, the other two are the ones that came to me straight away. The first one is there's no story. Oh, interesting. And you, you might be surprised at how often this happens. But in fact, I've even had some quite experienced writers come and 
send me a book and I've just said, hang on, what, what's the story? Where is it? Uh, with the writers who've already got some experience, that happens mostly if they decide to make a change of genre or if they decide to make a significant change in style because it seems to kind of reboot the whole process. And how do you deal with this issue of there not being a story uh, is actually something that I've been addressing myself to over the last few months. And um, uh, I, this is one of those moments where I'm not sure what tense to use because I don't know what your broadcast schedule is. <laughs> but uh, I have a course which is going to come out um, probably in September. And it is about what a story is fundamentally. And uh, in an, just under an hour, if I've got my timings right, just under an hour, I will teach how to understand what a story is, so it's the basic elements that it needs in order to be a story, in order to be present in the book. Hmm. Uh, and I have a, this is, I'm going to show you my prop as well, because this, oh, fantastic. this, this is what it's all about. Ah. So there you go. That's nice and cryptic. For, for those your... on the audio feed, you better explain what you're holding so up. So for those on the audio feed, I am holding up a traditional wooden cup and ball toy. So there is a wooden cup and it's got a piece of string that goes to a little wooden ball. And uh, you have to, just with one hand, you have to get the ball into the cup. And it takes several tries. <laughs> uh, it takes. It, it can take quite a lot of tries, actually. And, and if you're using, honestly... Unless you're a circus performer, I don't advise using uh, a prop like that in an instructional video. <laughs> no, I can imagine you were there. Yeah, there, there are a few that took me a, quite a lot of takes. Um, yeah, no, that's fun. That's fantastic. So, uh, so that's but, the the second thing is yeah. There's, yeah. there's no there's no story and no story. Yeah, so, so basically, the last so number three. Mm. There's no main character. Ah, or there's too many characters, or well, it comes to the same thing. Yeah. It comes to the same thing. Uh, there's there's a well-established uh, fashion for writing ensemble books. And doing so requires either uh, the innate ability to imitate the way that 90s and early 2000s uh, American TV dramas were uh, written, and uh, the other is... Um, is, is truly, truly prodigious skill at understanding character interplay. But even then, it's very difficult to tell a story if you don't have a main character. Mm. And... And also, Sorry. it's very ambitious, as in, you know, George R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones, this would be immediately comes to mind for me because there are so many main characters or so many characters, and yet he's been writing it for 20 years and he's amazing. So you like you can't do that with your first book. <laughs> uh, no, you can't. You have to get really, really good at it. But there are, there, there are so many things in writing fiction that you can't learn without trying to do them. Mm. And so it kind of it kind of means that sometimes I have a writer send me a manuscript and I say, look, this just isn't working, but don't stop. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I can see it's what they want to do. It's when you get the manuscript where the where the, the each chapter has the name of the character at the top of the chapter. Mm. Um, which is one of my, um, it's, <laughs> that's one of my buttons. That one sets me off. Oh, really? And that's what George R. R. Martin does. So those are probably yeah. fantasy writers. <laughs> George R. R. Martin, a little secret, he is not writing fiction. <laughs> He's writing He's history. He's writing soap opera. Oh, soap opera, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's political soap opera. I love it. <laughs> um, and, and many people do, and that's fine. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, it's not storytelling. What it is, it's telling lots of little stories uh, and it's create, it's putting a kind of story-like frame on an imitation of real life, uh, which is what soap opera does. I mean, you know, you, you, you can watch Game of Thrones or you can watch Corrie. There's really very little difference between, except for the number of... Violent well, I don't deaths. Know, actually. <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking. The deaths are maybe less violent on Corrie, but they do have them. But... Um, perhaps, um, you can put a, you can put a footnote in the 
video to explain what we're talking about to the non UK Coronation audience. Street, which to be fair, I've never watched, but I love Game of Thrones. So no, that's interesting. So um, just so people know, how can you tell uh, who is your main character, or how do you how do you create your best protagonist? Like, what if people have too many characters? Which one do they pick? Uh, it's the it has to be the character who is the only one who can tell the story. Uh, so it, it, you kind of have to eliminate characters until the story disappears. Mm, yeah. yeah, I see the point. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's a. I mean, it, it's a problem. To be honest, it's a problem I've only ever solved in conversation with an author. Mm. Uh, I, I've never had to do it on it on my own, and I don't know what an, uh, an author who's doing it on their own would do. But my advice would definitely be eliminate the characters one by one and see until if it holds the story up. disappears. Uh, or, or alternatively, choose. If, you, if you're working from a small number of characters, if you've got five or six characters, pick one. Try to tell the story with them as the main character. Uh, and when I say tell the story, I mean literally tell it, speak mm. it aloud. Uh, storytelling is a verbal activity, and writers don't do this. In, writers don't talk aloud to themselves nearly enough. No, it, well, it's interesting you say that because um, you know one of my last book, Destroyer of Worlds, I did the first draft with dictation. Very, you know, and it was hard to kind of change my mindset. But I wonder, do you? I mean, do you think? And I really felt like it was much quicker. The process was much quicker. Do you think that writers who are now using dictation are accessing these other parts of the storytelling brain that they might not by typing or handwriting? Uh, without a doubt, yes. Mm. Uh, there are writers. I mean, I don't know about you, but I type very, very fast. Mm, me too. Uh, and plenty of writers do type very, very fast, but. You're using your hands and instead of your tongue. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but when I'm writing fiction or poetry, uh, I have, well, have a, I'll have a glass of something to drink with me, but when I'm writing fiction or poetry, uh, I have to spend a lot of time without my hands moving and then I write a whole, a whole load of stuff. It's even more so with poetry. It's literally, I've got, I'm sitting here with my hands like this, thinking about what the next line is going to be. When I'm writing non-fiction, I can quite comfortably do that with a pencil in my mouth. Um, you need your tongue um, to tell a story. Mm. And I think that you will find the more comfortable you are dictating uh, the more the faster your style will evolve but also the faster your stories will evolve mm -hmm. and the best stories are ones that before you write them down you've already told them several times uh, the better you know it the better you write it and it's that the artificiality of the fact that 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 until recently none of us could afford someone to dictate to <laughs> yeah um, but, you know, you, you don't write, uh, what is it, 700 novels in a lifetime, which is Barbara Cartland, by the way. You don't write that many if you're not dictating. But you also, you don't write that many novels that are any good. <laughs> if you're not dictating. And yet, and yet when uh, I think her estate recently put into ebook are like 300 of her backlist and on the day they all came out I was just like oh it's a bad day for romance writers because everyone's just gonna now like spend a while getting through Barbara Cartland luckily the romance readers would get through 300 books pretty well, quickly exactly <laughs> <laughs> but that's quite funny. No, I, that's a really interesting thing. So um, we're already getting close to the end and I, I've got so many questions for you. I want to get back to editing. All right, you can invite me back. <laughs> I want to get back to editing. So um, in your book, um, Edit Ready, uh, mm. which is a, a great title, you say, quote, you may need some time to get over the shock <laughs> when people get their edits back. And, uh, you know, I, I've been through with an author friend recently. She got back her edits on her first novel and was pretty devastated. And it was, you know, and I remember when I got my first edit back and I was like, oh, my goodness. So how do people, you know, that, that the psychological issues of getting edits, how will these edits make them a better writer? How should they, they tackle this and, and work with uh, an editor or their own edits? How do you, how do you get through it, basically? Uh, how do you get through? So the first thing is, the, most writers, even the very first time they come to me, most of them they are they prepare themselves psychologically 
I mean, after all, one thing they say is that they're not sending their book to me so that I can tell them how great it is. Well, I wonder if a lot of people want that. A lot of people just uh, want, well, that's the, want but that. But that's the thing. I think, mm. I think people expect people to want that. But people do tell themselves, look, even if it's great, I'm paying him to tell me what's wrong with it. Mm, OK. <laughs> and that gives them a great kind of... Uh, it, it, it's like a get-out-of-jail-free, that is, because I can be really, really nasty and, yeah, but... You're just not telling me about all the good stuff because I'm paying you to tell me what's wrong. But actually, most people don't really think that way. Mm. They, what they really think is they say to themselves, well, what he's going to do is he's going to tell me all of, all of the stuff that's no good. And, and then I'm going to find, I, I, and then he's going to explain to me how I'm going to fix that. And so it's going to be great. Uh, but at the same time, yes, people want approval. They want recognition. Um, and, uh, in, in a way, I'm not there to give approval. Hmm. But because I'm involved in the creative process, uh, I do give recognition. Uh, authors show me who they are. And even more so when you see an early draft. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and you turn around and say, you know, you've, you've got a... Um, uh, uh, I said to one author, "You've got an awful lot of absent fathers in this, in this book," and 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 and, and he was like, "Really? Yeah." I said, yeah. "And uh, that's a that's a, that's a major theme here, is it?" Uh, and authors they don't see that, and he in fact dialed it back a bit in the next uh, in the next draft, which was fine. I mean, I think people don't want to expose themselves quite as much as they do, but imagine. You, you know, you're hoping for some approval and you're hoping for some appreciation and you're hoping that someone will tell you this is this has the potential to be a really great book, you know. And they t and I say, there's no story. Mm. I mean, what are you going to think? Are you going to think, well, OK, in that case, do, you know, do I have to start again completely? Uh, and it's pretty terrible. It's terrible for me, too, though, because if you've paid me to make to tell you what's wrong with your book and explain how you can fix it. And what I say is there's no story. That's not an easy thing to fix. No. <laughs> but it happens. Mm. And I, I've just finished working on a book where literally... Um, and, I mean, it, this I think it, it requires um, a certain amount of... I'm going to say talent, although I don't really believe in it, but it does... It, it requires a certain amount of ability in the writer to, to see how to do it. And in this case, there was a switch of tenses, some reorganisation of the chronology, and the injection of a few important inf incidents that kind of influenced the ways that the different threads of the story interacted, that, that suddenly meant that the structure came into being. Mm. And sometimes that happens, and sometimes it's kind of like... Uh, sometimes you're, you're kind of chipping away at layers and layers of, of, of unnecessary stuff to discover the story underneath. And sometimes it's like, what it's like the most often is, um, you know the installation at the La Brea tar pits where they have the tar and there's these models of animals that rise out of the tar? Uh, no, but it sounds oh, cool. OK. Well, <laughs> um, and... Because, you know, you get when you get tar on the surface, it preserves the mm. skeletons of animals. And the thing is, sometimes you can't see what the animal is until it's risen out far enough. <laughs> and that's that's what you're trying to do sometimes. So sometimes the story's there, it's just heavily obscured. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, how do you deal with all of that? Um, psychologically, I honestly think you have to remember that, uh, that you, you're on a, what I call a learning cliff. It's like a learning curve, only it's vertical. Yeah. And it stays vertical for a long, long time. Mm. And I think most people realise that quite quickly. They realise, actually, that they've got an enormous amount uh, to learn. Yes. And that if their first book is even publishable by the time it's finished, uh, then that means that their second book is going to be way, way about above it in terms of its quality. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that is the point. And it's kind of, it's a shame, but it's the truth. Your first novel is always going to be, the, the learning curve's going to be the, the highest because you assume because you're a reader, you've been reading books for so many years, you assume that you can, because you can write a sentence or an email, you can write a novel. And, you know, I think we all go through this realisation, 
which is pr pretty hardcore. Um, but I wanted to, a uh, final question, um, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask you about some tricks for self-editing, because the book is about actually how to edit it yourself before sending it to an editor. So what are the, um, what are some tricks for self-editing? Because often it's seeing our own mistakes is, is super hard. So what are some of the, the things we can do to make self-editing an easier process? Well, bear in mind that that my f my field of intervention is in the story structure. It's in the narrative, mm. um, and so seeing your errors uh, is not the easiest thing. The way that my book is, in fact, structured is is actually it's all advice that I've given to actual authors. Uh, because the, my thinking is, I've seen this problem several times in this book, so I'm going to give you three examples of what the problem is, but, but also I'm going to tell you there are several more examples in the book. Find them yourself, fix them yourself. Mm. That's the kind of advice that I'm giving, and that's the kind of advice that's in the book. If I was going to give a piece of advice to your listeners and watchers, hi, um, it is that it is... In order to edit a piece of narrative, what you need to do is think is think in advance. When you were writing it the first time, you should have actually said to yourself, imagine you're writing a scene, OK? You know what has to happen in this scene. By the time you reach the end of the scene, some piece of information has got to be passed from one character to another. That's an objective for the scene. You write the scene. If that happens, then it's done. You can edit the same way. Mm. And in fact, what you can do is you can... You divide the book up into chapters with, before you reread it. Uh, for each chapter, say what you think is supposed to happen in that chapter before you reread it. And then for each chapter, do the same. For each chapter, chop it up into scenes. And from memory, say to yourself, I think there ought to be a scene in this chapter. I'm pretty sure I wrote a scene in this chapter where this thing happens. Mm. And each one of those is an objective. You can have objectives at lots of different levels. You can have objectives for an entire story arc. You can have an objective for a chapter, a group of chapters, a scene for a descriptive passage. You can even have an objective for three lines of dialogue. Uh, and indeed, you can have an objective if you're getting really fussy for individual sentences and individual words. And I honestly, I think when you go back and you self-edit your first chapter, you should have an objective for the first sentence, an objective for the first word, for the first paragraph, for the first page, for the first three pages, because... At the very beginning of your book, your first sentence has got to get you enough goodwill from the author that they read the second sentence. And the first two have got to get you enough goodwill to get you to the end of the first paragraph. And so those are the things that have got to be absolutely spot on. Mm. So you've got to be able to say to yourself before you reread it, this is what I think it should be doing. Mm. And then you can see if it is. Yeah, and I, so you were almost... Um outlining after you've written it and I think that's a big a big tip yes. it's like I don't do an outline before I write I have a rough few scenes but then if I'm editing and there's a story problem like I really think there's something wrong with this story like something's missing I don't know what the first thing I do is go and kind of go okay what's the point of this and 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 by re-outlining even if you have an outline you can actually find some of these problems I do want to add on the first um the first line the first paragraph the first chapter that's to me that's the 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 thing that gets rewritten the most the most heavily edited part of your book is that first yeah. chapter so i want to just tell people if they are writing their first novel don't start with the first chapter or if you start with it don't bother editing it you know uh, you just remember you're going to edit it so many times if, if you obsess over the first paragraph and the first chapter now you may never finish a book so <laughs> the, 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 the self-editing <laughs> advice i give in my in my long course readworthy fiction is now you've reached the end, I say, delete chapter one. <laughs> just delete it. <laughs> Literally just... And honestly, this is for anyone who is attempting their first book. Yeah, write the first chapter. When you get to the end, delete the first chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Chances are, in any case... OK, so, in fact, in fact, if it's your first book, based on recent experience, delete the foreword, the prologue... Yeah, uh, <laughs> and the first the three preface, chapters, yeah. Uh, yeah. And... D delete all of those, delete the first chapter, uh, often actually.
actually the first chapter begins in the third or the fourth paragraph of the second chapter. Mm. Uh, and in fact, writing chapter one, yeah, it's it's really difficult. Mm. Uh, but but where is your story? Your story's here. It's not on the page. Your story's in your memory. When you've written, when you've created a great story, it exists as a continuous process in your in your memory. So when you go back and outline, don't be reading and outlining. Outline your story from memory and then see if what you wrote matches it. Mm. No, Because that is where you will find where you really went wrong in your narrative. Mm. And where you got self-indulgent and <laughs> So <laughs> which we all do no that's fantastic and you've given us lots of tips so um i hope that's given people ideas for their own books now um just tell us where people can find you and your books and your services online okay so head over to harrydewolf.com and i am going to put up a page especially for your listeners so harrydewolf.com slash creative pen and uh that should take you directly to the page where and most of the stuff that we've discussed i'll put links into any of the stuff that we've discussed um and i'll put in some exclusive content as well oh, and nice. i'll put in some coupons and i'll put in a sneak preview of the course i'm doing later in the year oh so sounds lots good of, <laughs> lots of goodies for your listeners you can also find me on facebook uh, my Facebook page is called uh, Dense Words, D E N S E W O R D S, uh, as is my Twitter. Um, and so is my YouTube channel. And I have a YouTube channel where I do uh, Q and A. Mm. Uh, and I put up a I put up a, Q, a, 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 a an answer to a um, to uh, an author question. Or a question about writing. Some of them are readers' questions. Some of them are authors' questions. Some of them are editors' questions. All sorts. But it's all mostly about writing. And I put one up uh, um, once or twice a week. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Harry. That was great. Thank you for having me.